Hi, I'm Andrew and welcome back to Home Theatre Engineering. Today, we're going to talk about home cinema design. Now, in previous videos, we've talked before about the two most valuable components in home theatre. Now, we consider these to be, number one, planning, that's home theatre design, and number two, audio and video calibration. Let's do a quick recap. Why do we consider this to be the case? Well, these are the two components that are the best way of extracting every dollar of performance from the equipment you bought, and the only way to verify that you're actually getting your money's worth. Remember, just building a better home cinema is always going to sound better, certainly better than what you previously had, at least hopefully, and it's probably satisfying even. But can you honestly say that you know that you've got every drop of performance out of your system? And generally the answer is no. Now how do we know this? Because in 20 years we've never yet come across a room, not once, that we couldn't significantly improve by either modifying the layout of the existing equipment or calibrating the equipment that's there in place. Not once, not ever, it's never happened yet. It will one day. We also know this is because of the number of cinemas that we fix up that have been installed by other companies, and there's lots of those. These are projects where the customers have paid another company the full invoice value, only to find their system is nowhere near correct or not performing at its best. These two items alone can be among the cheapest components, depending on the size of your project, but certainly amongst the cheapest of items that you will add. OK, so that's the why. Now let's talk about what. Now today we're just going to focus on one of those and that's on home cinema design. So what exactly is it? Well quite simply it's a way of optimizing every feature of your room, everything in it and how that equipment behaves in that room in a way that extracts the maximum results. Now how can we get a home cinema design done? How do we go about this? Well, it's not actually an easy process, and just going to a, a store and being sold a bunch of boxes is not an option. That's not a design. And someone just handing you a CAD design is not a solution either. Why? Well, we believe because it's a consultative process and requires lengthy discussion and understanding. Because every room has hidden challenges, and the designer needs to understand so much about you and your requirements. Finally, what about just computer-aided designs, um, automated inputs, where you just throw in your dimensions and it gives you a design? Well, this is a push-button process, but we find it doesn't work. We know, we tried it ourselves, we really wanted it to work because it would have made our job easier as well. Um, but we just couldn't get it to happen. Why not? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but first of all, awkward room dimensions. Client's personal requirements, like saying, I want to add a bar or a gym, pinball machines or a VR area or something else like that. There's also limited options on brands or product designs and the ability, inability sorry, to mix and match if required. There's no consideration of lifestyle or aesthetics. Or if something doesn't work, you end up either not knowing that it didn't work um, or not knowing why it didn't work. And there's no one there to take you through the process. So for us at the moment... We feel it's back to hard work and human interaction for the best results. So what we thought we'd do today is take you through our process. How do we go about a room design and how does that end up delivering the very best results and how do we know that? Okay, so let's go through step one. This is discussion and generally a lengthy one with the client and we discuss all sorts of things. So we start off with the room size. It's usage. What's the room used for? What's it going to be used for? What are your plans for it? What about aesthetics, colours, paint? What about the number and type of seats? How many people are going to need to use the room? I mean, really need to use the room. Not ideally, not like we're going to look after 50 people in the neighbourhood, but really, is it honestly just going to be you and your partner, or is it going to be a bunch of kids, or whatever? So we sort of delve into that quite deeply. What about alternate uses for the room? What about your budget? You know, seriously, how far are you going with this? You know, it doesn't matter. We'll work with you, but we just need to know what that budget is because obviously it's hard for us to work out where we're aiming for. What about your equipment dreams? What pieces of equipment do you really want to have in that room? What type of content do you watch? You know, 
And what are your actual expectations? You know, um, also we look at the number of channels and formats for audio. Um, and that becomes really important in determining a layout of the room, amount of acoustics and so on and so forth. And then we come of course to the image, so we talk about the possible size and format of the screen. Also we need to know what existing equipment you already have, so that gets factored in as well. We have a look at whether that's going to work in the future. Now what sources do you have or would you like to have or do you have that you want to change? How well are those sources actually going to work? Are they going to work with current HDMI formats or resolutions? Are your internet speeds um, high enough? You know, is there enough reliability and so on and so forth? And speaking of that, what about the resolution of audio and video? You know, what do we uh, plan for now and what do we plan for in the future? And ultimately, do all of these expectations fit the budget? Um, there's also the matter of time frame. How fast does this have to be done? Sometimes there simply isn't enough time if, if the deadline's short. This is a lengthy process. The other thing is, what about sound isolation? That's a whole sort of discussion topic in its own. And then, of course, within the room, there is planning for the acoustic treatment. So that's the discussion. That's just information gathering. Then we go on to step two. Now, the second step it's kind of integrated into the whole process really, it's not a clear step on its own, but in this step we aim to help the client understand what we are talking about, what we are doing and why. We try and give an explanation and justification of each and every decision and how we arrived at those decisions and the implications for the client. So that, that goes on throughout the whole process, it's just part of what we do. Then we begin the calculations. Now there can be a lot of calculations, at this point if we have the option, we'll look at calculating any optimal room dimensions. Now this starts often with an, an acoustic mode analysis which we gather, um, sorry, which we provide to the client. Uh, now often that can be provided for information if the room is fixed and we can't change anything, or it can actually be a decision point in designing and constructing the room. Um, we also calculate, uh, we start calculating potential light on screen, screen sizes, um, and those sorts of factors into the room. We start calculating seating distances and power factors for um, uh, speakers and amplifiers and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is just a guide at the moment. Once we've gathered some of that information, we then start building the model based on this information that we've gathered. At this point, we have no decision at all on the equipment. It's all about the room, as this will dictate what equipment will work best in there. And why a model? Why do we do it in 3D? Because we can see the issues as they arise. We can plan the room to the millimetre and make our mistakes there instead of in real life, which can be costly and even embarrassing. It's a great way to immediately see the problems, issues, challenges and compromises. OK, so... In building the model, the first step is the framework. That's the actual wall, floor, ceilings, doors, any recesses, rebates, cabinets, and, and other features that we need to add in. Uh, um, then we need to work out whether or not we need to actually reduce the area of the room if we're going to put acoustic isolation in. So is the room actually going to be smaller than originally thought? What about how many seats and where they can possibly fit? So we start to put seats in the model and we scale the model to the seats that the client is likely to use at this point in time. We then consider room orientation and many times in a model we'll get halfway through or even three quarters of the way through the job and then we'll realise that this really isn't working and we'll reorientate the room. What about other room issues? Um, things like awkward shapes, ambient light, screen area, subwoofer uh, locations, projector positions and alternate locations for those projectors. Um, what about basic speaker locations? Then we have to consider reflection points from the speakers and the implications of these and the amount of resonance in the speakers in the room. What about possible acoustic solutions? Aesthetics of those solutions, how it's going to look, is it acceptable to the client? What about room mode locations and any clashes with seating or subwoofer positions and so on and so forth? Are we adding in any features, you know, um, bars, candy bars, popcorn machines, uh, pinball machines and so on and so forth. And what about cabling access and requirements, power and all of the communications that we're going to need? What about remote control systems uh, or universal control systems? Okay, so that's all put in there. Now, step five, 
Finally, once the model is built and guided by the client's budget, we then start to seek out hardware that will actually work in the room. Now the dimensions of the room have helped determine this, so the first thing we consider is speaker size. How the speakers are going to look, the presentation of the speakers in the room. What about their sensitivity, power handling, dispersion characteristics? That narrows it down to a selection of products from which we can then choose the ones that suit the client. Um, there are other speaker challenges as well, things like off-access response, speaker boundary interference response, comb filtering, boundary gain, resonance, and so on and so forth. There are also subwoofer challenges. We have to, again, look at the location of these. What about cabling and setup of these subwoofers? Uh, are we going to need to move them? Where is going to be the final position for the cabling and the power supply for the subwoofers? Same thing applies to the image, so image challenges, screen type, is it going to be a standard screen or acoustically transparent? How is it going to be mounted on the wall? Is it going to be floating or in a frame? Is it going to be in a recess? What are we going to do about light in that recess? If it is an acoustically transparent screen, what type of acoustically transparent material? And that's going to impact the proximity of the screen to the speakers, which might reduce the apparent size of the room. What about ambient light? What about viewing angles You know, from different positions in the rooms? What about aspect ratios and gain? Okay, then we move on to things like the audio. So is it going to be a processor or an AVR? What type of amplifiers will best suit this room? Which screen size will work again in this room? And what projector will that therefore mean we need to select? How much light will fall on the screen? And what sort of image is it ultimately going to result in? Which subwoofers and where are they, once again? What seats and why? What sources and what does this mean for the rest of the equipment? And what do we need in the way of acoustic treatment and how will that be implemented? Okay, so we get all that together and then we reach step six. This is where we take all of that information and it's all built into the model and we go back to you, the client, and we have an in-person or online discussion with the client going through the model in 3D with you and we explain our rationale, testing our ideas with you, getting um, your feedback and acceptance, and considering alternate choices, ideas, and options. Then, of course, step seven, we go back to the model, implement all those changes that we've discussed, and make sure they actually work. Step eight, of course, back to the client, confirm all of those steps, and show them why they either do work or don't work. Then finally, we really start to get to the end of the process to a degree. Uh, step nine is finalizing that design, and step 10 is actually the client signing off, confirming uh, that they're happy with everything, and then we send the measurements and the other information needed to build the room, or of course, some customers opt for us to take over the entire project and do the room for them, and we do that all over the place. You know, I've just come back from working on two rooms overseas, uh, and that was pretty exciting too. So look, I hope that's given you a bit of a deep dive into how our room design process works. We'll do another one on calibration because that's the second of the two most critical factors that we believe in that delivers the best home cinemas. And look, this is our secret sauce. This is how we end up building home cinemas that constantly work, that constantly meet reference, that constantly achieve goals and exceed expectations. You know, it's the effort that we put in and the ability to measure the result of that effort later on that absolutely makes all the difference. And you can do this too, okay? So uh, you can do it through a lot of research. I think the important thing here is when it comes to room design, you have to think about who's doing that design. You can do a lot of research. Unfortunately, one of the problems is, you know, if you go to the forums and everything else, you've got a conglomeration of opinions, and it's very hard to work out which are the facts, which are the fictions, which are the opinions. So regardless of who you ask to do it, I would seek out someone who has qualifications. So look for ISF, Imaging Science Foundation qualifications. This means they're going to understand the picture, as, as will their um, qualifications with the PVA, the Professional Video Alliance. With audio, HAA, Home Acoustic Alliance, that's extremely helpful. And also, I would suggest that having a THX qualification uh, also means um, that they've got some extended knowledge and they understand some of the other formats and, uh, and also have also made the effort to gather these qualifications. It's not cheap and it's not easy. Also, make sure they've got the equipment to follow through. Make sure they've got all the calibration equipment. And generally, if you ask around, you can find out about their reputation. 
I think one of the hardest things to know is, is someone doing the right job? And at the end of the day, that's why we believe in calibration so much because, well, it's numbers. You know, you can measure the sound, you can produce a result, we can show that result and we can do the same with the picture. And so we know exactly where we stand. We know if we've done a good job or not and we know if the process we use is working. So look, I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope this has given you some guidance in the process that we go through. And uh, really appreciate you watching the video too. Thank you for being you know, a part of what we're doing. Thank you for joining our YouTube channel. Please like, subscribe and ring the bell. And you know, tell your friends. You know, We could use all the support we could get. And the, the more support we get, the more information we can give to you. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.